All right, doing it again. Okay. So yeah, so the first one I wrote up is Intro to Java that walks them through a like a bunch of examples of very basic Java code. So if they've never been, if they've never done a text programming language at all, maybe they've done some scratch, maybe they've done something else. Um, but ideally you would, uh, most of the time I'm gonna be doing this training over video with them and have them go off and do it. So I'm gonna be able to explain some things. So not everything is supposed to be read from the slides, but ideally if somebody comes late or doesn't wanna watch the video, if they read the slides, they should be able to get the gist of it and then ask questions. Um, so this covers a lot of the super basic intro to what Java stuff is so that when they look at robot code directly, they're not um, completely lost at what they're actually trying to stare at and they've interacted with a little bit. Um, it uses these um, an online compiler so they don't have to do, they don't have to download anything. They can click the link, the, code's already here, so they can start editing it, changing it, um, and they can run it down at the bottom. Um, so they can go through and like kind of explore a little bit that shouldn't take long. Like I assume if I'm teaching this, this would be an hour-ish maybe, um, depending on how what experience the kids have had. Um, and it kind of gets them all the way through kind of what our class is and some of the other just kind of generic things. Um, because I realized Spectrum at least never really had a way to do this. All of our programming, like we kind of introduced kids to programming, but it was very hard to get people from like who had never done it up to actually doing it on the robot. We would do some like intro stuff with either Vex IQ or some other things and jumping that gap never really worked. And I think the simulator actually helps for that. Um, so the second one is um, the one that actually walks them through downloading the FRC software for programming, um, the WPI um, lib file that has VS code and everything installed now, so it's all packaged really nicely. So a lot of this is all the work that the people who support WPI lib do, that, that did all last year, um, and they released it in 2020, and I didn't even realize some of it was released until recently, um, or at least how well it works. Um, so yeah, as long as the kids basically have a computer and a gamepad of some sort, because the simulator actually uses a, um, all the real gamepad inputs, um, they should be able to see something. So it walks them through um, kind of what the robot looks like. So part of this is so that the kids have some model of what they're actually trying to program. And the everybody is one of the simplest ones because most of, at least kids who were on the team last year have seen it. Um, if the kids weren't, they can go click on the video and have some idea of what this robot does, uh, right? It drives around, it has an intake, intake moves up and down and it has a climber. Um, and then the entire um, the entire file that I wrote to um, kind of the example of code is all there for them to download. So they can open it up and walk through it. Then they can actually look through the simulator. So I'm gonna switch over to, let's see, I might be able to share my whole screen. I'm not sure, let's see if that's easier. Okay. Well, I was gonna say, uh, Alan, while you're doing that, I, I just recently found, uh, uh, an Arduino simulator on Tinkercad and uh, you, you can run the code and then you watch like the servo move and the LED light and build it on yeah. a breadboard and stuff. So it's kind of cool. Was, so I was looking at, so we have these, um, we have these circuit playground expresses and there's a full simulator inside of make code where you can write out JavaScript and do that too. Um, and I've always, and I've, that, that was kind of what we've always, we've tried to do that in the past, and it's been very easy for the kids to not get excited about writing this thing that isn't for the robot. Yeah. Um, and it was always like this weird jump of how do you get them to robot code? Because that's the thing that gets the kids excited from what, at least for the, a lot of the kids we have, is they want to program the robot. That's one of the, a lot of them, that's the reason they join the team. Um, so being able to do that specifically is one of the things that they're really excited about. So the fact that this is the exact same code, well, this isn't the code we write on the robot. This is a very, very simple, Thing, but we'll get them to code that's really similar to our actual competition code a lot quicker than if they were doing Arduino or like a circuit playground or anything else that isn't running the full WPI lib libraries. Um, because that's a lot of, because programming the robot is very different than just like learning to program. Um, as most of it is like details very specific to FRC when you actually get into it. Um, Okay, yeah, so this is what I wrote out. I'm gonna make this bigger because Zoom is now smaller. Um, 
So it's basically a very, very simple, like no one should actually use this as their competition code ever, unless this is all you could do. Um, but it's not very extensible, like you would not want to do this very much. But it is at least it's easy enough and it's tick it took out a lot of the just details and things that aren't needed when you're first starting out and looking at something. Um, and so they can actually go through and they can simulate it. So if you click the little WPI button, this is the same way you like download code to the robot and everything. So everything's similar to, uh, relatively similar to what you would do to deploy robot code if you actually had a robot here. But instead you can just do simulate. Um, and it will, oops, I need to plug in my controller. So it had to start up the daemon, so it takes a little while. So it's going to compile this project, um, and it will let me. There it goes. So it asked me which GUI I want to run, which is only one, and you click OK. And now we have. Oops, nope. I dragged the wrong thing. Okay, let's go that way. Okay, so now we have the simulator up here. So this is basically showing all of the um, RoboRio outputs that we have configured in the code. So we only have the three PWM values. Um, this is the robot actually running right now. So this is like the time. So you could stop, you could pause it and it would like stop the robot code from executing. Um, Cause all this is doing is running as if it was a Java debugger, except it's handling all of the outputs. Um, so I already have it, it says I have a gamepad. So I can move these and it, moves all the values. And so if I open it up into Teleop, if I move stuff, we can see over in the smart dash or in shuffleboard that it thinks the robot outputs are all actually moving. Um, I have the controls, so I can do intake. I can do all of those different things on the simulator directly um, without having to have a robot near me for a lot of the basic stuff. Um, it gets a little bit more complicated if you start none of most of the stuff for simulating the um, can speed controllers don't work very well. So if you start getting into like a lot of the detailed configurations of configuring those and things aren't going to work. Um, but you can definitely set up the vast majority of the code you use on a robot other than configuring your speed controllers, which is a lot of it, um, which is still a part that we want to get it figure out. Um, but even some of that does work. If you use the WPI versions of those classes, they'll still allow you to do outputs and things to CAN speed controllers. Um, so that's at least allows you to go through all of that. Um, and then so the rest of the slide deck is just kind of explaining it with them and explaining section by section what this specific code does. Um, so then they have some idea of how to start getting where they need to. And then we would walk them through um, adding some things to it. It's so like none of the climber code was written out for them. So they we would walk them through adding it um, and adding some more functionalities. So you can go in and add sensors. Um, there's an encoder thing. So you can get there and set encoder positions. So if you wanted to like mimic an elevator, you could have code that if you change the encoder positions, it would change what the motor and thing outputs are doing. Um, so you can do a lot without needing a robot next to you at all. Um, and just kind of looking at either the shuffleboard or the direct outputs if you want to. Um, can the simulator I, handle generating encoder outputs based on motor outputs? No, so none of the physics stuff exists. Okay. So yeah, so that, that would need a physics model. There is, um, so there's another presentation that the person, uh, one of the people who helped write it did with um, WPI back in March or April, whenever they had the uh, their virtual conference. Um, and they're talking about that's one of the things they want to be able to do, but they don't know when that'll eventually get in. But eventually they'll be able to have a physics model that the Python simulator does do. Um, so if you were coding in Python, there's a whole, there's a better simulator that works for that one. That's, I believe it's PySim. Um, but this one doesn't at the moment. So yeah, so a lot of that type of specific tuning and all those you wouldn't be able to do. Um, but just kind of getting the program flow down, which is a lot of it. Um, or at least a lot of the initial learning curve, at least, um, you can do entirely over the simulator. Uh, any other questions? Went through that pretty fast. I didn't think we needed to run through it all together. Um, 
so so you're saying that uh, you can or can you do things I, I know you said you could have an input for encoders are there like other sensors you can do like limit yeah, yeah. switches and whatever oh, yeah, all that? Yeah, yeah so yeah so if you we can do something live so if I were to um, say we had a sensor on our intake right um, we could very easily write out um, is digital input already done? What's it doing? Um, so we could add in a um, intake sensor. Equals uh, new input zero. So yeah. So once you once you do that at all, um, I could restart it, and it'll restart the simulator. And now I have this digital input here that I can change low to high. Um, we can see what the other things look like. Coders, uh, coder. Uh, there we go. Uh, um, yeah. So they could write out whatever they wanted here for any of the sensors, anything that is in WPI libs library, they work. So you wouldn't be able to do them if they're directly attached to a speed controller. You wouldn't be able to simulate that directly, as in like, you wouldn't be able to uh, simulate the Talon encoder directly, um, as far as I know. Um, they may be working on that, because I know both the vendors are doing some stuff to make the simulator better, um, but I don't know what's been released yet. Um, Uh, tell me what you need. It's like two inputs, right? Oh, but it can't be, I'm using zero somewhere else. Maybe, yeah, you did it right. Okay, yeah, so in here you can go in through and you can set encoder counts. Um, so you could just type them in. You could pause it and have it change whenever you want. Um, yeah, we can switch directions and things. Uh, oh, that's reverse direction. Reverse direction. What? I'm not sure what that is. Interesting. Um, but yeah, there's also, you can have gyros. You could go in and change the different gyro heading and see the robot react. So if you wanted to write the, if you wanted to write a PID loop in your actual WPI stuff with all of their um, PID library, you could have all of that running, and then you could change an encoder value to something, and you could watch, like you could graph it over on, you could graph the motor output over on um, shuffleboard, and you could see it respond, and you could tune the PID value. You just wouldn't have any physics, so you would only see it like respond very quickly because it would be at the right value, right? Um, so you could change set point and things, um, but it wouldn't actually, it wouldn't be a real PID graph because you wouldn't have the physics simulator behind it. But you could at least see how like your state machines change or anything like that based on changes in sensor input. Uh, any other questions? Uh, so yeah, so I've had a couple kids kind of start. Whoop, that got weird. Xbox does weird things. Um, I've had a couple of kids start playing with this um, and going through the slides that I wrote up recently so then we can get it slightly better before we run the whole team through it um, or the team that wants to learn about programming at least. Um, a lot of the newer students I imagine will as well. Uh, do, what was the other thing? So the other thing that was on the list is to look through the Spectrum 2020 code for like how we did PID setup or people interested in it. People want to see it? I'm yes. interested. <laughs> um, okay. I will... Who was that? Was that Josh? <laughs> that was Josh. Maybe. <laughs> wow. I get it. Yeah. People, if, if, uh, no one's keeping anybody here, so like, feel free to have a good night. Um, <laughs> it says Josh is muted. <laughs> oh, no. I was unmuting myself. 
Oh, okay. <laughs> Somehow, in spite of being a programmer by trade, I have no idea how to program FRC robots. Oh, okay. Well, that, that I can so, do. I am down to learn. Okay. I'd, I'd be better off if they were programmed in Fortran. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, we can do that. You know, to, when I was at Purdue in 2006, the, the introduction engineering class was still in Fortran. So... <laughs> Hey, wow. Do <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay, That's so. NASA's looking for a Fortran programmer. <laughs> Who is? Who? NASA. I'm their yeah, guy. I'm for age 45, but NASA's looking for a Fortran programmer. Uh, okay, so I can give the brief walkthrough of what, like, the robot structure looks like. Um, I'll also be confused at some parts because... I haven't looked at some of this code, I'm pretty sure. Like, students wrote most of it. Um, and hopefully their comments are decent-ish. Um, I know what most of it does. I'm, I try to make sure I can fix stuff if it breaks. Um, so hopefully I know what actually happened. Um, so yeah, the general FRC robot. So this is the robot.java class, which is the same one we looked at before, which is like, if you only have a single file that you want to edit, you can do everything in robot.java if you really wanted to. But then once you start doing complicated things, everything's in one giant file and it just all breaks. Um, so over the years, we've built out, WPI has built out different structures um, and different like design patterns basically that you can use to make your code easier. Um, one of those is being the command and subsystem. Um, I don't I want to say pedagogy for some reason, but that's probably not right. Um, architecture. Architecture, that's probably better. That's a lot easier. Um, <laughs> so um that basically allows us to have and it's really nice when you have multiple students working on things too because we can divide up tasks so we can have a student whose job is to write the shooter subsystem code and the classes and the commands for that and it's easier for them to take kind of responsibility for that section of code instead of having to like have everything in one file and then people are committing on top of each other and it's just you're doing merges constantly and it's just not fun um and it also just takes away a lot of the a lot of the details for the code, for the robot that you would used to have to do and kind of like write your own kind of logic and stuff for are all handled by things that were written by people who have tested a lot more and all the people who actually commit to the, um, the full WPI library um, of code that kind of all of FRC robots are sort of based on most times. Like there are some teams who ignore large chunks of this and write their own stuff and that's totally fine too. Um, so, in here, all that really matters for what we're doing is this robot container equals new robot container. So that is a model that they started this, this season. I don't love the robot container name, but it works. It's just another file that we'll look at in a second. Um, and that's kind of where we define all the stuff unique to our robot is in this robot container thing. Um, and then a very important thing is this command scheduler dot get instance dot run. So this is what tells the robot like all the times through the loop, hey, check what commands are supposed to be running right now. And then if they're running or if they're supposed to run, run them in like certain orders and figure out what needs to be canceled. And it handles all of this different command stuff happening to all of our different subsystems. Um, and it lets us do a lot of very easy things. So if we have, um, say like our, if you have an intake subsystem, and one of your commands is run the intake, but you have some other, um, you have two different commands tied to a button or something, if, or to multiple buttons, it tells you, it tells them which one wins. So you're not like trying to do two things at the same time as much. Um, things like that are a lot easier to get done um, because of the command scheduler. It fixes a lot of those issues um, for you. Um, and then in our code, we have some complicated stuff that doesn't really matter because we were trying to make things run efficient, but that's not important. We're just trying to kill stuff that WPI includes, um, which you probably don't want to do because it makes debugging a lot harder because we like disable all telemetry from live window, which is not the best idea, but we were just trying to get rid of uh, any sort of data that was getting sent over. It's probably not even that useful, um, but there were some things we were trying to clean up. And then we have some other debug stuff in our code that lets us um, kind of have names for stuff so we know when the print lines come out in our log files we know like which subsystem they are for. So our robot has a drive, it has a funnel, it has an intake, it has a shooter. Um, 
it is a tower, it is a climber, it is a limelight, that kind of thing. Um, I don't think there's anything else in robot that actually matters. Um, no, because we never got the test stuff working, so that doesn't matter. Um, okay. So yeah, like I said, robot container is where the WPI lib now tries to tell you to put everything that's your, um, that's kind of specific to your robot. Um, they model it a little bit differently than I do. I don't remember, or than we do. I don't remember exactly what their difference is. I want to say they make like instances of specific classes that get a little weird where we just make public static versions and just say it's good enough. Our robot's not getting another intake. Like it only has one. It's fine. Um, like there's a bunch of stuff you would, you would never want to do in an actual like software project for any sort of application, but you can just get by with because it's a high school robotics competition and it doesn't have to be perfect. No one else is like editing this five years from now. It's just this team of students and most of it has to work for a year. Um, so it's definitely not ideal um, logic in certain places or like ways to build things out, but it's good enough for the kids to understand it um, and for us to run with it. Um, okay, yeah, so here we're similar to what we had in that other file. We're just like, we're naming our controllers. We're naming our different subsystems, um, which we'll get into in a second. So we have one of each of these. Um, let's see, we have, there's a driver station. This is where you get back, like, if you wanna know what position your driver station's in, or like the match time and some other stuff, you can get it from the driver station class. Um, we have a PDP, so we can get like current from each of the motor channels on the PDP if we want. Um, spectrum preferences is how we set up, um, the preferences class, which lets us do things on shuffleboard. I don't know if it's gonna show up here because we don't have it. It is, should show up somehow. File, nope. There's no like add thing. It's okay. Mm, interesting. Okay, I don't know how to do that. Somewhere there's a shuffleboard thing, but I don't know where it is right now. Um, but basically there's a way to go on there and you can edit a bunch of our settings. So a lot of our PID settings are set through preferences so that if we edit them live on the driver station, they get saved the next time the robot reboots um, and they get saved all the time. So we don't have to go in and edit code all the time. So we build in some stuff that allows our um, drive team to kind of edit the code without having to know how to program. So if they're like, if our driver's like, Ooh, we're turning a little fast, they can go in and like change some of our, turning values and change it just to suit them without having to know how the code works at all. Um, and they have like complete control over some of the preferences that we use for that. Um, and that's, there's a preference thing built in and we just write some stuff on top of it to make it a little bit easier. Um, most of this is not important. Oh, so yeah, so then this is the biggest thing. So this big list of like, what looks just like gibberish at some points because of how much text has to be here. Um, <laughs> is just how we tell all of the button bindings to work. So for every every button that the operator needs to be able to do something or the driver needs to be able to do something, one of these is basically telling it to do that. Um, so like this is the, the trench shot. So this is, there's two different, there's like spectrum two buttons. So it means you have to hit both of these buttons at the same time. And while they're held, it's setting the shooter velocity to a certain speed. Um, this would all get changed eventually to not be hard coded numbers here because that's not ideal because to edit them we have to go in and edit this number specifically right here and they're like not saved anywhere it's probably not written down anywhere um this is this is all code prior to a first event of the season which means it's a little jank right now um normally going into second and third and state champs everything because we're doing so much more testing everything gets brought out to where it's a lot easier to edit a lot of these like detail numbers and things um, so that they're not just like hiding inside the code. Um, yeah, we're how the D-pad does things. Um, oh, there's some- uh, Alan, uh, oh, yeah. if, if I can interrupt and either yeah, ask you a question or, uh, so with uh, the preferences, um, I, I can't recall offhand and just might be good to remind people it's, it's good to have default values written into your code because if something happens to your robo rio 
I guess it actually stays on the shuffleboard, right? So if you have your different yeah. a different laptop, preferences does not. Values. Preferences does not. Preferences only saves to your Roborio. Um, so yes, so that is one of the things we do is we'll um, our preferences get changed, but we go through and we'll store them back as the default values in code at some ideally regular interval, normally at least after every event. Um, but we'll try to do it earlier than that. And you can download the preferences as well and have a backup. So going into an event, we'll make sure that we have a backup preferences file saved. So if we need to replace the RoboRio at an event, we can. Um, but yes, that is very important. It, for preferences alone, they are saved solely on the robot, on, the, on that specific RoboRio, um, which, is, which can be scary if you don't back up nicely and do things like that. Um, one of the things I would eventually like to do, which we have not, um, there's a couple things I want to do, but eventually you could have a USB thumb drive just plugged into your RoboRio and you can have it automatically back up to that, um, which would be, is on our plan to do. Um, it just hasn't gotten done. Is the ability to download the preferences something that's in your version and not the WPI lib version? Nope. It's in the real version. I think it's on, um, I don't remember if you can actually do it from Shuffleboard. You may have to do it from some Dash from uh, the other one. Hold on. Uh, I think you have to do it from smart dashboard which is like not used by many teams anymore um but somehow here we got like no that's the old preferences that's not real preferences right no that's just dashboard preferences um oh yeah if i don't have a preferences actually running it's not gonna let me do it um oh no it will yeah robot preferences and then you can just hit save here and then oh, we we can't see uh, wait, <laughs> the no, window I'm, that you're in oh my god <laughs> my bad i thought i was sharing the whole thing again i did not okay now you can see Okay, smart dashboard. There is a um, if you do. No, I can't right click. Let's, oh, because it's smart dashboard. Yeah, if you do robot preferences, then this has like if I was actually connected to a real robot, this would have all of our preference data running, um, and I could save it and then load it back in if I needed to. Um, and some robots we do that a lot more on. Some we do it less. It just kind of depends on who's the programmer. That year, a 2018 robot would have like done nothing had we ever lost that preferences file because everything was on it. Um, after that, we started putting more of it back in as the default values. Um, so in our, in the way our spectrum preferences work, the way we like added stuff, we j basically check if the key exists, but you have to have a default value for everything. So no matter what, it would do something if the preference file was completely gone, um, but almost nothing would be tuned in, but it would like still work. Um, ish it would move motors <laughs> whether they would do anything nicely i have no idea um um yeah so we we're looking through robot container we do uh, here's the question yeah uh, what's up i haven't i haven't programmed for real since well last time i programmed for real was on a pc when that was a specific model from a specific manufacturer um, so that's older than some of you on here. Anyways, um, when you come up with all these names for your variables and all this kind of stuff, do you go and publish like a table that says this guy is for this so that other people that are writing code that may need to pass, say, a value to a piece that you're writing so they use the same name? No, it all, it all, no, because uh, so in for Java, you don't have to do that since yeah. you're not passing, you don't pass by name um, in, in the, like the name of the code doesn't actually matter. And plus everything auto completes if it ever did. Um, so like, you, there's sometimes where there are like enums where it will matter, I guess, because then that is stuff kind of by name, um, which I don't really want to get into exactly what an enum is. Um, but there are, um, that would be like the only time. Most of the time, you're, it's all somewhere in the method. It would just go to the right, but you're just passing the number that you need um, or you're passing the right type of class and everything. Like it'll check everything ahead of time. And the compiler will check too, if you're passing classes that match what you're expecting. Um, it won't let you like do it too badly. And then you also, you can test it and you'll, you'll get the runtime errors if you do manage to get something that's really broken. Um, and if you're trying to use globals, uh, VS Code, or and all of them have uh, the like auto complete. So you start typing something, and it will like give you your options of variables that you can. 
Correct. Yeah. So like if I like that's one of the reasons why some of them start the same. So if I type underscore here and make like V, it tells me vision limelight right there and I can click it. It knows it, it knows it exists. So like it it in, it's called IntelliSense. So it's looking, it's analyzing the code and it knows what variables and what scope and everything is for whatever file I'm in at the time. Could uh, it could it say I'm developing code on a separate computer? concurrent I mean, with you developing it then i mean so it's all, it's all over github at that point right like you're okay. you're working in your file we commit and then we you have to merge if you're working in the same file but that's all that's all done through uh, okay. version control okay um yeah that, that would having a table would take i mean like in theory you could but it would just it's not worth it. We've never run into a time where you're not just like looking at the entire code and you can't find where the variable is. Ideally, this would be, some of this stuff should definitely be commented a little bit better, but we had most of the stuff we need um, where a lot of it is also just like intuitive, like the climber is climber. We know what that is. Um, Use there. Uh, yeah, I feel like it's one of those things where it's like, well, it's a high school competition robot, not a product that you're delivering to a customer. Correct, yeah, yeah. Sure. Um, the only people that have to read this are people who are editing and running it, right? Like the, the whatever, four or five, six, depending on the year, however many of us there are that year. Um, and as long as they don't do something like one of my uh, classmates did where he had variables like OOP, like O-O-P and then O-O-O-P and then O-O-O-P. Right, right. So, yeah, so like, those are, I mean, so yeah, all of our kids know that I would just be mad at them if I don't know, if I can't know what a variable is, right? So like almost everything is, you, you write your variable names as explicit as you can to mm -hmm. make them be obvious to what they are. Um, okay. Yeah, like on occasion yeah. you'll get something that's just super weird and I'm like, no, stop that, do something else. <laughs> your, your tool's a lot more sophisticated than what I last used. <laughs> Yeah, I always try to teach my kids to say, call your variables something intelligent so we can understand them. So my kids decided to name them something intelligent, A, B, C, D, E, F. Yes, Albert they, Einstein. They would, not be, they would not be writing code on our robot very long if they kept doing that. Like, they would get committed over very quickly in our GitHub. Um, okay, so so much of that so that that's basically a lot of it is basically it so i'm not going to go into like exactly how like some of we don't even have real auto on here i don't think because we had some other stuff i don't think this commit that i have open has a lot of the auto in it um but yeah so once you actually build up these once you have these subsystems that kind of exist um and you tell um do i even where do i initialize stuff somewhere i would do that right do i not I don't think I, oh, you don't need more because they do it themselves somehow, right? There's some like, I'm trying to remember this year, they changed some things and now I'm trying to remember exactly how this works. Set up. Oh no, because it's in robot container, robot container builds during, yeah, we're good. Okay. Um, so because of this command where it makes robot container up here. So this happens at runtime, right? It makes this instance of robot container um these are allowed to exist um you're allowed to make them new up here which you, we used to do if you look at our old code we had a different thing that was like set up subsystems that would call all of these at at when it actually ran um but robot container solves that so that's one of the reasons why they moved to robot container this year uh, can you switch back to sharing just the vs code window so it's uh, i can that's easy enough um Josh, oh, you need yeah, to make up your mind. No, well, no, it also, it, I forget that I'm on like a 4K monitor, so I assume that's really I, I'm good. just teasing Josh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, that makes sense. <laughs> um, okay, so, so this is our, this is where you start actually getting into the nitty gritty. So um, each of the subsystems and their associated commands is what does um, the actual bulk of the work for the robot. Um, so like one of our students, um, was responsible for the shooter this year. Um, so inside of the shooter class, which extends this like subsystem base. So it tells it all the stuff that a subsystem can do. Um, and some of the methods it needs to have exists for it to be a subsystem. Um, we build in everything that's associated with the shooter gets 
built into this class. So that's the, we had a three motors on our shooter this year. Um, the configurations for their um, uh, PID commands, and there were two different ones. So we had an uh, accelerator wheel and we had a shooter wheel. So there are two different sets of PIDFs here um, and integral zones. I guess they were using integral zones. I didn't actually tune the shooter this year, so I'm not really sure what they did. Um, I know most of what they did, but I'm not sure if those are actually being run right now. Um, it, uh, yeah, they are. They have numbers associated with them, so apparently, yes, they are. Um, I don't have. Um, so. Here's where we use our spectrum preferences stuff and set it all up. So, oh, actually, I don't. So that means I, I don't know what these numbers are because it's very possible that these are changed on our preferences. So this is where you run into problems. So because these are spec pre preferences, um, they, um, it's very possible that these aren't the actual numbers that are running on our competition robot right now. Um, so the only way to know that is to go get the preferences file off that robo Rio. Um, they are supposed to come in here and update these relatively regularly. Um, but I do not know, especially with like how fast the shutdown was. I have no idea if these are the actual ones we ran at the event or not. Um, they should be close because they, I know they updated them at least a few days before we went to Dripping Springs. Um, cause I told them to, um, but it's very possible that they changed some stuff. Um, so these just basically get the number from that preferences file right when we make shooter. Um, so if we wanted to change something, you have to like edit preferences, then you have to restart the robot code so that it pulls that new number again from the preferences file. Um, and then it creates our, um, it creates our different talons or our, um, their talon effects, which are Falcon motors. Um, it does a bunch of configuration. So this is one of the things that we're not able to do very nicely on the simulator. Um, ideally, we're going to figure out some way to teach a lot of this configuration stuff, but this only has to happen. It only has to be done once. So you don't really have to have every program on your team know how to do these super well. Um, but it definitely is a lot more of the code nowadays when you are making sure your motors and stuff are running in the right direction. So if you don't like set them inverted or not, they may not work in the right directions. So they may not go the right way. Um, um, same with some of like the a lot of the closed loop settings, if you're doing PID control, all of that has to be done on each of the, um, each of the speed controllers. Um, yeah, the, the, at some point we've gotten to the point where there's just like a lot of complication because there's so many different options you can have on these speed controllers now that if you don't go through and like specifically set everything, it's possible that they're set some other way. Um, I don't, Think, did they reset these beforehand? I don't think they did. They normally are supposed to. That doesn't seem good. Huh. We're configuring, I think, most everything we need to, but I don't think he ever actually reset the Falcons. Weird. Normally we would reset Falcons up here somewhere, right? When we like, um, as we go and start making shooter, we would reset them back to their stock from a uh, stock setting so that if for some reason we have to replace one we're not putting on some weird setting we don't know to configure um, um yeah so this basically configures all the pid stuff for the um for each of the two different shooter wheels that we have so it's sending that kp value which we got from preferences up here it's actually sending it to the Falcon. It's doing it for all those values. Um, and then we finally tell our follower Falcon on our shooter, because those two are connected together. They have the same, or they're connected to the same wheel um, to do the same speed as the leader. So we only have to do the two PIDs, even though we're controlling three motors. Um, let's see. We do some log stuff. So setup logs is down here. Um, that was so we could pull, um, we could pull actual like CSV files of just like straight shooter data off our robot. So we could go and graph it and see how to make it, see if we could tune it any better. I don't know how much we actually got, I don't know how much they actually used this, but they had it all set up and I believe it was working. 
as far as I know. Um, they showed me data at some point, so I'm hoping it's still working. And then um, this last little bit right here is really important. So you, you want to know what happens if we're not telling it any other command to run. So if we're not currently telling it to go to a speed, we want to know what it should do. So this 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 dot setup or set default command um, basically just tells it to stop, um, which it does some more complex weird Java stuff to do that because we didn't want to write a whole stop command. Um, and they added a bunch of these new, um, I didn't prepare this to remember all the names. Um, but you can do Lambda stuff where basically we're, we're passing the method to the run command. So run knows, it's, it gets everything it needs to know that it's an actual command. Um, and you just give it an actual, um, you give it the runnable, which is stop, and you have to give it a subsystem, which is this. Um, so it's taking in its own shooter subsystem. Uh, this is where things ideally, if it wasn't so easy, I wouldn't have it in our code because it's one of like, this line makes no sense to a new programmer. It makes very little sense to me because I'm not a programmer by trade. Um, I've just been doing FRC for a long time. Um, so I understand how it works and I can do it, but it definitely is not something I want to have to teach. Um, so it's very possible we get rid of some of the stuff like this, but it's so convenient and fast that we may have to eventually get there to where we just allow it. Um, and it hopefully get it to where we can comment it enough to where students can understand it. Um, and then a lot of the other stuff inside this after all the setup. So that's basically just the setup. So that runs once at the beginning of the robot um, and just configures everything that um, we're going to be able to talk to the talons about. And then from here, it's just how do we, um, these are just methods to allow us to tell the talons to do different things. Um, so we have like some set percent output. So if for some reason we wanted to not have it running on speed control for some reason, we just wanted to tell it to run at 50%, we can do that. Um, if we wanted to set the accelerator wheel separate from the shooter wheel, we can do that. Um, Cause at some point I think we weren't running PID on the accelerator wheel for a little while. We were just telling it to go. Um, I think we eventually, that was before we think we had everything tuned in. Um, and then same with our set velocities, so we can tell them a specific velocity to go to. So that's where we were doing, um, that's what this stuff is calling down here, the shooter.set velocity. It's calling, um, mm, nope, take it back, ignore what I just said, that's not true. This gets used in our commands, which I'm gonna get to in a second, which I should have known. Um, and that's where these methods will get used. But if we wanna actually set PID velocity, it gets done with this because you have to do this control mode velocity, which is how you tell the talons to be in velocity control mode. Um, so this is also, this would be the same thing um, when we talked about motion magic earlier, if you were in control mode, you could do dot and you could change it to motion magic. Um, you could change it to position. Um, so depending on the type of PID you want to do, there's just that you have to tell it what control mode you're in. But since we're shooters, they're easy enough to just do in velocity without, we don't need the trapezoidal motion profiling or anything like that. Um, having a stop is super useful. The number of times kids forget to tell the motors to stop is very annoying. Um, they're like, my code works, but it doesn't stop. I'm like, did you actually tell it to stop? No, okay, then it probably is doing what you told it to do. You told it to go. Um, um, some just get classes. So if we want to um, figure out what our set point is, what our RPM is, those types of things, we can get those easy enough. Um, most of this is just used to display stuff back to us on our shuffleboard or dashboard or logs or anything like that. Um, dashboard velocity. Oh yeah, it's sending. No, it's getting a number. Oh, dashboard velocity is getting the numbers from the smart dashboard. So if we're trying to like tune something and we just want to be able to edit in the velocities really quickly, um, one of the commands will call this method. This will pull the preferences. Um, this will pull the preference file every time, set it to wheel RPM and accelerator RPM. It'll do the conversion conversion on it to whatever we actually need to send velocity because we don't send it. Um, revolutions per minute, we send it ticks per, 
flat or millisecond, whatever it is, it's ticks per something. Um, it's whatever that confusing, um, ticks per hundredth of a second, somewhere in there. Um, so that's in the, that's all in the um, Falcon or Talon SRX documentation for what they use. Um, and that will, these two will set those velocities. Um, same with, yeah, so shoot, set shooter was if you wanted to set them both to the same. I don't think we ever, I think we needed that for some testing stuff we were doing. Then we pretty quickly realized that was bad. So we stopped that. Um, and then set shooter velocity is will RPM and accelerator RPM. And so that's what we're actually doing in here with this like new run command set shooter velocity. So we don't have to, um, because of some stuff they added this year, you don't have to write whole classes if you just want to run a specific method on your subsystems. Um, so we don't anymore for some of it just because we can make it a little bit leaner to not have to have a bunch of files we're editing and things. We can just go through and edit them right here. Um, which isn't, which has some downsides because a lot of stuff ends up happening inside Robot Container. Um, so for me, as a person who has to like oversee it, when I see the students submit stuff and commit to the version control, when I'm looking through it, it's a little bit harder to figure out what was actually changed because I'll know somebody changed Robot Container, but then I have to like read through and figure out what they actually changed if they don't write good commit logs, which they don't always do. By that I mean like they never do. Um, that's one of the things we got to work on too, especially when we're gonna have more programmers, um, is so that I don't have to sit there and like read through their code to make sure they didn't do something too crazy. Um, yeah, and then dashboard is where we put out all the values so that we can actually see them on the shuffleboard um, and see what's happening with the motors and graph them and all of that. So that's what that does. Um, and then I don't know, did we not make any shooter? We really didn't make any shooter commands. Is that real? <laughs> I'm learning things about our code while I do this too. I could have sworn he wrote cheater commands, <laughs> but apparently he did not write cheater commands because they're not in the commands folder. So that's fun. Um, so yeah, so apparently all of our cheater commands were just done in line with the run command button, um, which he decided to take very liberal use of on this robot. Yes, okay. Um, yeah, because we basically had those three and we had the ability to set dashboard, um, which is all we needed for at least our first event. Um, that's cool. Um, do we have anybody want to see different subsystems and commands? I don't know what people are actually interested in seeing. Like, there's a bunch of... Files. I'm curious to know what the DJ subsystem is. Oh, uh, I'm pretty sure it does nothing, right? Oh, it actually, why does it have so much stuff in it? Oh, he actually wrote all of this. Okay, I knew this. I didn't realize it saved in the code. Um, oh, DJ is uh, the um, the color wheel because it's the DJ booth. So the DJ spins the record. We named things interestingly. Um, also, the what was the actual real name? I always call it, the, I, I, I've gotten so used to calling it the dance floor. I don't even remember rendezvous point. Wheel of Fortune. Rendezvous. No, no, the... the Will uh, the actual name was the control panel for the DJ booth the thing the it was rendezvous something for the area yeah, underneath it's rendezvous the, something rendezvous zone point something but yeah we called one, it the, one of those. the entire season um, because there was a DJ booth next to it or two DJ booths next to it it's a much better uh, name yeah this does all the he had it all set up to be able to do all the color sensing with the rev color sensor. Um, which I did not realize got committed into master. I thought he was still doing this over on a different library, but apparently he was like, no, I will be ready. So if we really needed to attach a color sensor, color wheel mechanism at Dripping Springs, we had the code in the system apparently to do so. <laughs> yeah, he has a whole Spark Max and everything ready. All right, cool. Um, I honestly did not realize this got into master. Um, exciting. <laughs> it doesn't, he doesn't call it anywhere, I don't think, because we don't ever instantiate one. Um, because we definitely don't have that motor on the robot. Like it's not mounted at all. Um, Can you show one of the commands that does? Oh, something? yeah, absolutely. Um, what are fun ones? Um, 
Intake's a really simple one. So this is kind of the command. This is the basic layout of a command. Um, so you extend command base, and then you um, initialize it by telling it, one of the ways to do that is to tell it, one of the things you have to configure for it is what are the requirements for that command. Um, so what's the best way to describe this? So commands are, they do a lot of stuff in the background that's really nice. So if you have a requirement, say like it, it has to have the intake, if, um, if intake down is running, that also requires the intake, and then I start intake balls, intake down stops for me. So I don't have to tell it to stop. It knows, hey, something else is asking for this thing that I require. I'm gonna get canceled um, and let intake balls run and have control of it. So you don't have two things fighting for control of the same mechanism as long as you deal, do this add requirements thing and you list out your subsystems properly. Um, that's also gets important is how you like divide up subsystems because sometimes things that may be associated together may need to have um, separate um, separate subsystems. So like there may be a situation in some robot where you wouldn't want to have your accelerator shooter wheel and your main shooter wheel in the same subsystem because you may want to control them by different commands for some reason um, and not have them overtake each other. Um, um, you then you initialize. So this basically runs once when the command is called. So for intake, it does intake down. So it tells us to lower the intake and it starts the collector. So it starts collecting balls. Um, and then execute happens every loop, but there's nothing that needs to change for our intake balls command. It just needs to keep holding the intake down and to keep collecting. Um, and then the, the thing that's called once at the end is um, end here, which does intake up. Um, we don't need to call intake stop at all because since we're gonna be done with a command, intake can have it a default command. So we didn't, just like we had on shooter, it's default command is stop intakes. Oh, it did something weird. Okay, sorry, let me get to intake. Um, intakes default command, I'm almost certain should be stop. Yeah, so if nothing is called on it, stop runs on it no matter what. So it, it's allowed to stay down or up, but it's not allowed to stay moving unless a command is running. And the reason why you don't have anything in the execute for the command is because you're using PID modes. So that's all. No, being no, 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 no. For intake, it's not PID. Intake is just run. It just sets speed to 0.75. So intake collect just tells it to go to 0.75, and then we just don't tell it to a change from that. Right. So as long as it's running, it's already told it to go to 0.75. It knows it's. It knows the command is still running. So it's like, hey, I'm supposed to just chill here at 0.75. Um, and so there's no reason to have anything running and execute because we just don't need to, we just need to, we don't need to constantly tell it to be that number. We've already told it once. Uh, what, what would you put in execute? Oh, what would we, we put an in example of something that uh, has that? Well, that's a good question. I think so much of our stuff. Well, if you have motor safety enabled, you'd have to put your set command in execute. Otherwise the safety timer will go off and shut your motor off. Um, Yes, so that used, I'm trying to think why we don't have to do that anymore. Did we disable motor safety? I don't think we did. We might have. Did we disable? That sounds like an unsafe thing to do. I don't know. We've done it in the past. It depends on what my programmers do. They, they sometimes decide some systems don't need it um, or all systems don't need it. They sometimes Only the referees whine about unsafe robots. Um, I mean, the motor safety, not like, why we the driver station goes away. <laughs> the driver yeah. station goes away, the robot stops no matter what. Uh, right. But yeah, I'd have to look back into why motor safety doesn't kill itself there. So it Josh, an example of something, uh, an example of something you could put in the execute is if you're waiting for a like value to be reached before you go to end. So like if you were waiting for a ball to be sensed by some kind of push yeah. button or something like that, you could have that in the execute. This is an exact example of that. So I think, is it? Yeah, so this is, um, so this is intake. Um, and so this is checking on our ball sensors in our tower. So that, that feed into our shooter. Um, so here it's checking, um, 
get ball top and get ball bottom. So as long as, well, as long as both, if both of them are true, it changes trip to true and it tells it to index down. I don't think I wrote this code. I mean, I guess I didn't because I don't know what this does. <laughs> and they did not comment this. Um, why did they do this? This is like all good questions. Um, why did they do this? Performance for what tower? It has tower and funnel. Trip starts equaling false. Robot tower is closed. So this is. They wrote no comments in this, did they? They really didn't. Okay, so that means the we have a little like mechanism on the back of our tower that lets us expand it or close it. Um, so it's closed. So that means it's like intaking balls up. Um, it's telling the intake, we're telling intake to tower. So it's spinning, um, it's spinning the tower up, I believe. Yeah, so it's running the, that's like the funnel code to spin our little V funnel motors that like bring the balls into the top of the tower. It's spinning those in at 0.5 and 0.6. So there's like a slight speed differential there. Um, and that seemed to work for us to not cause any jams. Um, and then index up is the actual tower code that's telling it to run the tower at about 40% speed um, while we're just kind of bringing balls in. And then at some point, but is open and close not set correctly? Is close open? Hmm, that's interesting. Did they write this? Did we never fix that? Set false. Hmm, I'd have to double check that. So this is why having a robot would be nice or like writing my own code. It was working, so it's probably fine, but it seems like I'm in my head, these are logically backwards to what I would call open and close, but also the other person who wrote this probably calls open and close the other way. So we've probably never had a standard yet. Then a lot of this would get fixed out. We didn't do our, we'd only do some sort of design review or like programming code review after our first event. And we definitely never did it this year since we were scrambling to try to go to another event slash had, um, everything got shut down. Um, but yeah, so basically the, the idea behind what this is trying to do is um, figure out whether we should have the back of the tower open or not while we're bringing in robots or while we're bringing in, um, while we're bringing balls into the tower and then we eventually tell it to, um, we eventually stop everything. So we eventually, this is finished equals true means that, okay, we've finished this stuff. Now we're, we're done with, um, we have three balls in the tower and it's ready to go basically. So once we've tripped, which I believe is basically saying, yeah, once we have a ball, once we're noticing a ball at the top and bottom, we have now, um, we have all three balls in the tower and we're ready to be done. Um, but yeah, so that switches the tower open, which in my head should be closed, but apparently that's not the way we wrote it. So luckily I'm not the one who had to program that. Um, okay. Um, anything else people want to see? One thing I would be curious to see is uh, how you set up your, your Rev uh, Spark Max motor controller. Oh, we can do that. Um, subsystems, none of them, none of them did anything too complicated anymore because they're just, our rev is, I don't think, are any of them running PID stuff? I guess they are because, oh yeah, he did write all the PID stuff for intake. That's cool. I really, I should just really look at our, my own code more often or like my team's code. Um, <laughs> I really forgot what made it into master. Um, Okay, so yeah, so this is intake. So this is um, a spark max for the intake motor, um, a solenoid that's on a double solenoid. So we have an up and down solenoid, even though it's, it's just one, but it's two different outputs. Um, for spark maxes, you have to tell them what kind of, what features you're using of it. So you have the can spark max, but you also have to have a can PID controller and a can encoder, even though they're all part of the Spark Max. Um, it just allows you to tell like which libraries you're inputting. Um, 
So yeah, so this is the CAN Spark Max. We tell it it's a um, it's a brushless motor, um, and we're getting the intake motor from constants. Oh, I didn't talk about constants. This is where we set up all like the numbers. Um, we used to call it hardware, but then they changed the name this year. We well, we used to call it HW. They changed the name this year and made it slightly more complicated for some reason. It works the same way. But basically, if we need to go and edit a CAN um, value or a solenoid value or anything, they're all edited here. So we know exactly where those are. Um, OK, so yeah, for the revs, we definitely do remember to restore factory defaults. Um, so this sets all the settings back to um, just as if it was a brand new Spark Max right at the beginning. And then we go through and edit everything else and modify our settings through the rest of the setup process. Um, so for the intake, we do have a current limit. It's pretty small because I think the intake's on a 30 amp breaker, so it has a smart current limit of 32. We never needed to, I don't think that was ever tuned in. I think we just typed 30 and it didn't break, so we left it there, that's my guess. Um, the intake is set up to coast instead of break mode um, because if there is some if there's like a ball jammed or something and we want to get it loose, we don't want the break mode trying to like stop the ball from getting unjammed. Um, if we're like able to do it with a drivetrain or shake it or something, if we had to. Um, set inverted just means, most likely means that the intake positive normally is going to be like out and we probably want it in. So we flipped it so that intuitively know that the motor is spinning in. That's when when the motor's spinning forward or when we give it a positive value, the balls are coming in the robot. That's normally what we do for intakes. I'm guessing that's what we did again. Um, here, the PID controller gets existed. So it's motor.get PID controller. So it, the CanSpark, it does have it in here, but it's easier if we have it as our own. We can have it as its own class. Um, so we can reference it without having to do motor.get PID controller dot whatever every time. Um, that's why he sets it up this way. Uh, then there are the PID coefficients. We don't have these set up to get from preferences yet. I don't think he was ever editing them that much or tuning it in to do that. Um, at some point, these would probably be preference values, but also I doubt we were ever going to tune our intake that much at an event. Because um, all, all it really had to do was spin somewhere close to speed and the balls were going in. Um, the only reason we wanted to do PID on it was if it gets jammed, you can get more power than what you normally give it. So if we're normally just setting it open loop, we would only tell it to run it like maybe 50% or something. But if there's a jam, it's just still gonna run at 50%, it may stall. But with PID, if we're telling it to always run an RPM, if there's a jam, it can run at 100% and try to unjam if it needs to. Um, so yeah, so these are all the configuration to set PIDF, iZone, everything else. I mean, he just set it all up even if he wasn't using it. Um, and then he did put all the numbers on Smart Dashboard, but he had no way to edit them. So I'm not sure why he decided to do it that way. That seems odd. Um, and then this final call right here, motor.burnflash, um, commits it to the, um, the onboard ROM for the Spark Mac. So if we do get a, if it somehow the Spark Mac resets in the middle of the match, this configuration won't run again, but it'll have all the values still um, when it comes back up. So it'll know it has an encoder, it'll have all its PID values and everything will already be there. Um, and then... Is that something that you can do too many times or will it? Technically, yes, but you'll never do it in a season from what I understand. I don't remember what the actual count is. That's definitely a Toth question. Um, but it's some very those, those things tend to be in like the thousands. It's a very big number, and it's not happening in any reasonable lifetime of how often I turn it off and on our robot. So yeah, that, that was one of the main things I was kind of curious: is like, is that best practice to do that, or is it best practice to leave it out if you just set everything? I don't, up? I'm trying to remember who I talked to. It was either it might have been Greg. Right. It was somebody from Rev, and they were like, "You should never have to worry." And I was like, "Cool," but I don't. I yeah. don't don't absolutely quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure that that's true. I mean, I wouldn't want to do it every time through the loop or anything, but um, whatever setup. Yeah, but one every time that you restart robot code, you're probably fine. Yeah, um, for sure. For the lifetime of our Spark Maxes, like we don't, we're not going to run them. I doubt we're running them 
multiple seasons too often, right? Like maybe one or two will end up on a robot once or twice, but most time they end up on practice bots or somewhere else in the lab anyway. Um, that I can't imagine they're the ones that are getting constantly looped. Um, and that would be a lot. Like you'd need, I don't, yeah, I don't know how often you'd have to, I guess if you just like sat it and it happened to have like a runtime error right after all the setup worked and you just like sat it there running that constantly, you could eventually hit it and that would be bad. But like, like if you left it on overnight um, or over days. <laughs> um, yeah, then the rest of it, Oh, he, he is doing it. Why is he doing it from smart dashboard? See, this is why you have different programmers. They do different things. So instead of doing it from preferences, he set it up to get it from, to put the number to dashboard and then to get it back from dashboard when he called set velocity every time, which is kind of annoying. Um, it works. It's totally fine. It's how we used to do things before we had the preferences thing set up. Um, because this won't save. So if you go in and edit these, it doesn't save to the robot at all. And you have to, if you, if it turns off, you've lost that value forever and you have no way to get it back. Um, oh, except they are actually writing them. Yeah, this was an interesting choice. Okay, so, so all of this logic is to check if any of these have changed. If they have changed, write them out to the controller, but don't write them out if they haven't, which makes a lot of sense. Um, so I think he wrote all of this so that he wouldn't have to restart code between editing the values. It's definitely what he did. Um, so with preferences, you have to like restart code or it, does, it won't pick it up again. But this way, he did not. <laughs> so it works. Um, but it's just a different way to do it in two different files in our own robot, but it seems fine. Um, so yeah, this is just checking each of these P's versus KP's and checking if they're equal or not. Um, yeah, and then this has very similar stuff to the shooter where it's just set speed. There's some collect and reverse so we can set what our values are. So yeah, so for competition, we weren't using any of the PID stuff. So we would have changed collect and reverse to running set velocity if we were actually running PID, but here we were just running it at three quarter speed in and out for the first event. And then eventually this would have been something we were gonna tune in to get velocity control all the way through our ball path. Um, and I know we had it working partially at some point, but it, for some reason or another, I do not remember what, we just, we nixed it for our first event. And like this never got logs, so that's fine. We probably didn't need to log the intake very much. Uh, anything else people wanna see? Um, this is just our smart dashboard stuff. We have some stuff not to make us like constantly put out dashboard stuff. We have some short and long stuff so we can put it out less often um, and it runs in its own thread. Um, I don't remember who, so some stuff just like gets carried over from code from like forever ago. I'm pretty sure this dashboard flask method got written in like 2014 and has been in every single one of our robots but basically we had a big problem where the dashboard would just like stop working but we couldn't tell it stopped working um so this sends a single bully into the dashboard that just flashes every 20 milliseconds or so whatever it is um so we know if that stops flashing that we know we've lost dashboard connectivity <laughs> there's like an indicator in things that's supposed to work but it, it was freezing so now that just exists and it just gets copied over every year for in yeah for forever probably Oh my, it's almost nine already. Okay, I did not realize it was that late. Okay, um, any last questions? Do y'all use Robot Builder for generating your skeleton for this or you just start totally from scratch? Uh, we do not use Robot Builder. Robot Builder confuses me for a lot of things it does. Um, <laughs> I, it may be better. I have not touched it in a while. Um, so much of our code is uh, so I'm trying to think who wrote the skeleton from this year. One of our leads wrote the skeleton this year and kind of late started laying everything out. Most of it was based on 
the documentation and like samples from the updated WPI live stuff from this year that came out and then our previous year robot and they kind of just smashed them together. Um, so there's some stuff that is done in the new ways and there's some stuff that's done in a few things that are done in our old ways. Not m most of it, I think they updated to like the new models because like they left it named constants, which if I had written, I would have changed it because I don't like typing constants. It's a long compared to HW, which what we used to have. Um, but it's, I understand making it the same as everybody else is useful. So like, it's fine. And I don't, it, it, I try not to connect, like dictate just because my old ways, like they have not been working on these robots for nine years like I have and you look at the same code so I can, I can adapt to whatever they want to use sometimes. Um, and then we have some stuff from other teams. So we have um, Helix has their stuff that exists, um, Helix Utilities, which is really cool. So they have some files that we steal from them. Um, so they have like math classes and things that we don't have to write our own. Um, I don't remember why we had to actually copy that code because before it was actually in our, it was in our build file at some point, but apparently we stopped doing that. I don't need to get into all of that. But you can just pull it straight from GitHub and things, but I think we had to edit something to make it work with something somebody was trying to do at some point. But So we had the actual raw code. Oh. Anything else before we end? Cool, if anyone has any other questions, I'm happy to answer um, offline or anything too.